some sense of where I wanted to be. And what I didn't want to be is in New York City working with people who were so caught up in their bureaucratic systems that fix the problem was just not in it. The idea was to make everybody who qualified for the program grateful that we good people put a program together so that they, they, they can eat and they can have a place to live. And we spent most of our time telling the, unconsciously telling the client population, bow, mm. bow, say thank you. And the only ones that understood that this wasn't really any help was the client. Because they knew that they had to stay dysfunctional in order for us to get help and in order to feed our egos. So I needed to get away from <laughs> what I was doing and help the people who said, who are you? I don't want no help from you. I didn't ask you for anything. Those were the people who needed it more. And, and, and calling out these systems that stronghold them in poverty, like the Department of Social Services, like mental health programs, mm. like uh, low-income housing programs. If you're not working to help people to do better so that they don't have to live in low-income housing so we can get another family in low-income housing and move this, this person into moderate housing, then we're not doing our jobs. But what happens, and especially in a place like Newburgh, Poverty just resonates with the local government, mm -hmm. and it resonates with the poor. And the taxpayers are the people walking around saying, you need to do better. You need to, and you should, and, and I don't want, and why should I have to pay for you? Because they're stuck with the brunt of the, the, the cost for the city. The city is saying, we really need our poor. Because poverty is a big business, and as long as we have, have this big business, we get this big money to, in my mind, misappropriate. So we have to leave those people poor. Because if you're getting money for, to address poverty, and you have poverty, then you're not addressing poverty. And if you have 80 churches, and there's poverty, why do you have 80 churches? 132. In the I'm city sorry. of Newburgh. I beg to differ. <laughs> I was just thinking with what I could see around Newburgh. <laughs> but we have to address the problem. How did the problem begin, given your historical you know, background and understanding? And you as a social worker, um, how has that impacted, let's say, since uh, industries left this region? The same way it does in every region. Industries leave not because they don't like the people or because, the, or, or because something isn't in the people isn't working for them. They leave because the, the, the local politics pushes them away. The fact that the politicians can't get out of one another's way. They can't form a... a Alliance? Well, well, Coalition? They, they, can, they do that. It's just an unhealthy one. But they can't form a sense of how to be with the people and truly take care of the people. So you're saying a sense of community. They lack the capacity of forming and forging alliances that would create a culturally competent and productive community. They lack, that, that, that to, in, in my head, is, is, is sort of what, what my mother used to say, kind of highfalutin language. They don't have basic skills. They don't respect the people. And when you don't respect poor people, that poor people don't think they're deserving of respect. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's a big problem here. I hear people say all the time, well, I only see the politicians when they need my vote. Well, right, because it's over 29,000 of you, and I can only get to a few of you. But it's easy for you to get to me. If I give you my telephone number and say, call me when you, when, you need, when you need me, call me if you have a problem, I'm here, and you don't call, that's a problem. That, and that's something that I create, too. 
because maybe I don't make you comfortable enough to feel like you can call and tell me about your basic problem. Right, right. And the other piece is that when you're in a community that has been traumatized and industry leaving is also a trauma, tra traumatic, traumatic experience. experience for the community itself. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't have a way to heal all of those things that have occurred prior to that, mm -hmm. then what happens is that people don't reach out. That's people right. don't have the motivation to reach out. And it's something else you said about making it a safe space, a, a space, space where they can feel that you really do that care. And I really and meant you really, it. Yes, yes. I really mm -hmm. meant it when I said call me if you have a problem. Yes, but yes, and, but they gotta feel that. They gotta they gotta they gotta know mm -hmm. that that's that's it's it's not see, I think that what we miss is that there is a, an intuitiveness about people who have been oppressed. There is a sense of knowing about people who are oppressed. Inside of schools, children are very attuned to those who care about them and what they need, mm -hmm. as opposed to what the person who's saying that they care about what they need. They know, they know. And the people, in terms of politicians, in terms of uh, those who are uh, there to serve, they know if you're there to serve, and they have gotta feel that yeah, what you that what you that what you say. Yeah, I can go to her. Yeah, I can go to yeah. her because she's not gonna judge me. She's not gonna blame me. She's not gonna shame me. She's not gonna do those things that keep people from wanting to come. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yesterday, yesterday, <laughs> I stopped to with the uh, Eastern Stars. They were having a an auction, and I was going going in just to spend some time with. And as I was getting out of my car, this woman says, oh, hey, hello. So I said, hello, and I smiled and went over to talk to them. And there was about five or six people sitting outside, and there was one guy that said, can I ask you something? So I said, sure. He said, why are you here? Why are you in Newburgh? What made you move to Newburgh? So we talked, to, talked about that, and then he said, I don't believe you. I think you want to make us look like Harlem when you when you um, changed Harlem so that black people couldn't live there. And I'm thinking to myself, first, I should only have that much power. <laughs> That's the first thing. <laughs> Second thing is he's afraid that I'm coming up to gentrify the city. Um, not that I could have just fallen in love with this city and um, wanted to be here because what I said to him, I said, you know, I had moved here after divorce and I was looking for a city where I wasn't known as High Gay House Steve, like that was all part of one name. You know, people would say hi to me and then ask me how my ex-husband was doing and I just wanted some space, you know, away from that. Um, but he said, why do you love us? You talk like you love us. Mm -hmm. You don't love us. Nobody loves us. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't know if I love you. Because if I say I love you, then that would imply that I know you well enough to say I love you. And I, and I really don't. But what I can tell you is that I dislike poverty. And I don't see, see a reason for people to have to live in these conditions and then I pointed to the area. He said, but it's always been like that. What do you think you're going to do? Mm. Why do you think you're going to change it? Well, I think that he was, he was right on. Astute. And <laughs> I, right on. And, and I think that and I, I think did, I didn't have an answer for right, it. Right, and that's what we say. I don't have an answer. But the, the idea that he can say, he can ask that question. He can ask. Yes. Because he's tired. Yes. He's tired of yeah. it. He's tired of people standing in front of him saying, well, I love you. I just love Newburgh and I love you. No, that's not true. I dislike poverty. What, what, what makes you think you could fix it? Other people couldn't fix it. That's true. In my mind, it's the college try. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't, I didn't stay, stay long enough to have that conversation with him. And he certainly didn't want to hear from, from me but I get their anger, their
their frustration. Their mistrust. I, their mistrust. Yes. And they look at me, and I don't look like somebody that's going to help them. I look like the biggest sellout in town. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can be okay with that. And it's my job to gain the tr public trust if, if that's what I, what I want to do. Yes. But it's not, it's not their job to fall blindly behind, behind me you, because right. I'm black. Right. They, they, they should be a little leery. So. Yeah, so Is there so anything that someone can do with the globalization of the labor force and uh, diminishing employment opportunities when you have a considerable proportion of the population that's not, not even registering as unemployed, but they're not even looking for work, much less an employment identity? So when we have an education system that is only preparing people to work for the company and not for themselves, uh, which seems to be a significant problem in Newburgh, how do we address you know, diminishing employment opportunities and an education system so dysfunctional it can't prepare you know, uh, children and youth for this type of global economy? But see, that's the point about education, that we have to rethink education, and the world is rethinking education. And what Onaji said, uh, self-reliance, is that that's a mindset. It's a mindset to, what was that quote, 40, 40, 40? <laughs> uh, there's a 40, 40, 40 scam. You work 40 hours a week for 40 years, mm -hmm. and then you're supposed to live off 40% of the salary that you couldn't live off this 40% of your salary when you was when working. When you were working. So the mm -hmm. scam is to have you believe in this formula that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so that's where education, into my global, you know, the whole education paradigm is shifting. And so these brick and mortar schools, they're going to be a, a thing of the past soon. And so when we start, start thinking about it, there's always the dilemma because you are also looking at the human dynamic and human relationships. So if we started teaching virtually, we lose a significant portion of what we, who we are as human beings because right. we need that connection. We need the interaction. We need it. We need it to, to feel uh, the uh, sort of like the organic being that we are. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just it's just shifting. And we can we allow we allow that when we don't question. We don't get into conversations. Conversation changes the dynamic of everything That's once right. we can get in a conversation. And it's important to have conversations because then you learn how to disagree. That's right. Agree. That's right. Debate. That's right. Argue. Right. That's right. Stay on your ground. That's right. And so, so with our work, this is where we start. We start with these conversations. So there's an invitation conversation. How do you invite somebody to be in a conversation with you where they feel like they're safe enough? Mm -hmm. to have a real conversation where their real stuff is going to come out. That's right. You know, how do you uh, g allow dissent? In a democracy, there's dissent. And if you are never in a conversation where you can say, no, that's not what right. I agree to, or no, that's not what I meant. If you can't do that, then you can't be have an equal voice mm -hmm. at the table. And so then there's the idea of um, possibility. Like, if you were in a, the state of a, a conversation about possibility, what's possible beyond what we see right now? Right. So we stay in the conversation about the past and the complaint about the past, and we don't have a conversation about what's possible. Mm -hmm. And then That's what right. are our gifts? You know, the That's conversation right. about what's your gift? I, I could go 40, 50 years of my life and never realize what my gift is. That's right. And so, but you know why I don't know it? Because no one has really been able to show me or tell me what my gift is, or no, allow me to, to mirror right. That's right. who I am. That's right. Well, and so that notion of the gift. And then there's uh, the idea of um, commitment. When we make commitment, what does that mean? That's not a barter. You know, a commitment is because it's something that I see that is a reality that I can help build something or create something. Mm -hmm. And so then there's the, um, that's the gift conversation. There's an invitation conversation, there's a dissent conversation, there's a commitment conversation, and there are two other conversations. Um, one is the um, uh, responsibility, no, what's the other two conversations? The two other conversations. Okay. But we start with these conversations. Mm -hmm. This is how we began the process in Chester. 
Well, actually, this is how we sustained the, con right. the, the process in Chester, through mm -hmm. having these conversations. Mm -hmm. And that's why it goes back to what we said, like, nothing happens without a conversation. That's right. And so that's, you know, that's the, that's the work, is how do we create conversations mm -hmm. where we can build trust that's in right. our community, you know? And understanding. Yeah, I use a different, you know, Frontsman has kind of mastered those conversations. I look at it from consent to relationship, to a bunch to um, empowerment and, and abundance. That is any human endeavor that produces something more at the end than it had when it started will go through those four steps. People consent, they agree to agree. Now once you're working with them in the relationship, you will see how far that agreement can hold. Can they the agreement hold through the through the uh, dissent, can it hold through the arguments? Can it hold can it hold up through the conflicts? And if it does, people realize I can do something greater with this person or with this group of persons than I can do by myself. So then you feel a sense of empowerment, then you know, okay, let's hang in here, and then you finally get to the stage of abundance. That is the dynamic of human progress, and for our people. That's the only way that we're going to move ourselves into another another situation, that we have to go through these four changes. And even when you get to the top level, you start again because now it's a higher goal that you're trying to obtain. Mm -hmm. And it's really a cycling up through these different four stages over and over and over and right. over again. But uh, because there's so many external forces happening at the same time that you're trying to do this, people get thrown out the game right. before they can complete mm -hmm. it. So it's, it's really understanding what's going on on the outside and also what's going on on the inside of you and, and being able to work that through so that you stay in those four right. stages. Right, right. And this notion of consent, and I think you and I had this conversation, is that when power is present, mm -hmm. sometimes we think we're in consent when we might not be. Right. And so we have to unpack power in relationship to be consenting to things and not consenting to things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea of um, you said consent and um, the C reach consent relationship, and then what kind of relationship are we going to have? Because if I'm in a relationship with you where there's a power dynamic and I don't have a sense of uh, self efficacy to uh, challenge that power in relationship to consent, and that's what you're talking with this descent. So if I don't have the inner uh, right. courage to dissent. You know, even in the notion of consent, then I'm not really in consent. I'm, you know, going because I don't, I'm going with it, as opposed to saying, okay, I'm consenting to this and I'm in agreement with this. So it, it does work in terms of those uh, four dynamics that you talk about, but we're always in the process of, um, um, what do you call when you're working through things. Renegotiating, renegotiating those contracts. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Renegotiating the contracts all the time with consent and the relationship, what the relationship is. You know, so it's definitely, you know, those concepts, you know, even with the concepts about the conversation, those different things, they're always uh, in constant flux. Like, you know. The two other parts to that is for um, community. Because once you, once you go through these steps, but you, you have a notion of community and, and what you want the community to do and how you want to grow, mm -hmm. that's going to keep pull, propelling you forward. And then the last stage is healing our spirit worldwide. Right. So those those are really the six levels, you know, uh, the four plus the other two. And, and we're working through all of them simultaneously. And in my private practice, I find that I'm talking with people more about their contracts. We're saying the same thing again. Mm -hmm. And how to renegotiate these contracts. I remember asking um, a woman, well, what do, you th what, do you, what do you think your family wants? And she offers her her opinion. And she's right. She's right about what they want. They want, you know, they want to make her home, cooking, dinner ready, all of these wonderful things that she's always done. But what is the other agreement? If you do that, then there's another agreement that never gets talked about. That's the unconscious contract. Mm -hmm. And she sat for a while and she said, is it that doing that stuff doesn't make me happy? I said, bingo. 
<laughs> That's what never gets done. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. But yes. but we we and it's we tend to say in the black community, I've changed my mind. I didn't change my mind. I became enlightened. My unconscious contract became conscious in my own head, mm -hmm. and I said to you, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do this, mm -hmm. and so I'm renegotiating. I'm, I'm renegotiating these agreements with families and friends constantly, and and I think part of the healing is knowing that that's okay. However, yes. you bring that to yes. you, to the the, t the healing table. It's important that it gets there. Mm -hmm. the, the families that we work with, the families that we watch on television who's struggling, who's in pain, who's suffering, we have to get them to learn how to get all of these contracts out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And you see how we went from the political to the mm -hmm. clinical? Yes. You know, it was to the education. Yes. yes. So it was just like mm -hmm. a very oh. seamless I, I want to make that conclusion education because yeah. you made an excellent point you know we don't have self-education because if you don't know who you are and I remember a First Nation woman Watiala Atim I think that's her name she says um, we knew who we are we were in collaborative communities okay as First Nation people okay uh, we had our own democracies we we're the first initial democracy we had an identity However, with the co-opting and the corporatization of our identity, we've lost who we are. We've lost that language, the language we put on the quilts. And so I, I'm here to ask all three of you now, you know, as we attempt to redefine ourselves and, and to redefine our identity, the, it's not going to come from the education system. Uh, we have an adequate information coming from the community because we don't see ourselves as a community. We've lost our citizenship to become consumers. Right? Corporate consumers. We're corporatized educationally. We're only going to teach a certain way. We're going to teach a certain type of information. You talked about skills and, and about our, our gifts, okay? Our gifts were not taught or trained to develop them, much less identify them. And the little gifts that we have, they're reallocated and, and, uh, and, and uh, allocated disproportionately to the corporate sector. You are quantified based upon what you can produce. And that's part of the empire psychology, the psychology of empire. Where, as you indicated, it's not just affecting black people, it's affecting all middle class people in this country, which has an economic, which has a global impact. I remember um, an African man whose name I can't even pronounce, but he's listed as Times 100 Influential Man of 2014. He said, in terms of Africa, he says, when you see the news on Africa, it's 3,000 people are killed, then we'll get some coverage on it. You'll see one black boy in Baltimore killed, he gets major coverage. So he says, we're not going to see, he says, Africans right now, we are at a standstill. 65 years after the revolutions in 50 countries got their independence, we are still redefining who we are outside of the colonialist identity mold that's been given us. We want to pursue the colonialist mold, but at the same time, we want our identity. So there's this internal struggle. So how do we successfully negotiate building an identity first as an individual that's free of the corporate, you know, uh, the corporate control, and at the same time as a, as a community that we live in. How do we empower a community? Grow on crops, have our own stores, have our own market economies. They came in with the fur traders. Fur traders came in and says, oh, we're gonna force you into a market economy, and then we're gonna exploit you and your land. And then they, they what we thought was exchange was thievery. And then they brought the missionaries in, and that, that was economic imperialism. Then we had religious imperialism, where they said, oh, you're not who you are. We're going to tell you who we are. And that's based upon the relationship that they imposed upon them. And then you had the, um, you had the, uh, the military that came in, and that was a form of genocide to reinforce the laws that was being imposed on these people. So basically, back to you. Could I, could I just add something? I just want to no, say, I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking to myself, the very basic answer, and, and for me as to why I people get very annoyed with me, we just need to t start teaching black history again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I could go, I could give off mm -hmm. a hundred reasons as to mm -hmm. why things changed, who I am, mm -hmm. and where I've come from, but if my neighbor doesn't know that, mm -hmm. Did I sound like the crazy mm -hmm. panther? Mm -hmm. 
Militant. The crazy militant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I remember <laughs> sitting at a city council meeting, and it was during the, the month of February uh, that I hate, because I'm what? black every Do month. Do we have to think about it? Absolutely. But, but um, the, the mayor always seizes the moment to talk about Martin Luther King and how we should all take a lesson from him. <laughs> And I was sitting mm. at the end of the table, and I was furious because there were there were all of these white liberals in the room, and they were just clapping, and they were shaking their head. And I was supposed to be a very apologetic about what I said at the last meeting <laughs> um, about hating Black History Month. <laughs> and when she finished, I said, "This is all very nice. Well, you you're talking about your hero. I'm talk, let me talk about mine. I love Nat Turner." Mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Dr. I did my busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. King is not only a hero. Mm -hmm. He's a hero. He's not the only one. But if you, I think our children get frustrated because he's the icon for what white America can tolerate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the he's the person that that it's okay to to love. No, only because he's dead. Right. 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 <laughs> Doesn't right. Because he's dead. That's all the reason. Right. Well, well, there's a lot of others that are dead. <laughs> and they, they don't let you love them. <laughs> but um, the, the biggest part of our problem is we don't know all of the all of the other people who have helped us to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In an article that'll be out tomorrow morning in the Mid Hudson New Times, I take a stab at the blacks who um, objected to my petitions and had me removed from the Democratic Party. And at one point in the, uh, my view, I say, well, to that I say, I free, <laughs> that too, that's what I guess. <laughs> To that I say, I freed 1,000 slaves, and I could have freed 1,000 more if they, if they, they knew only they, knew they were slaves. slaves. <laughs> because mm -hmm. you, you turning on me, or you, t you're not turning on me, which is why I could smile. Mm -hmm. You're turning on what I bring to the table. You're telling other people that what I bring to the table isn't good chicken soup, and I know it is. <laughs> but it's not me. It's what I'm bringing, what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and it's it's so hard for this 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 Hudson Valley to to have a black gay man, well black, mm -hmm. to have a black woman, and then have a black gay woman. Oh, wait, that, 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 <laughs> well, that, you've gone too far. Crossed the line. That's, that's, that's out of space, though. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right, and all of those all of those things they say about us, I have no idea what they're talking about mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I'm just as sleepy as the heterosexual women <laughs> in, in the area. <laughs> but um, we're not teaching our children mm -hmm. to their history. As a result, they they're losing their respect oh. for their elders, mm. and so it goes right back to all of what you said. If you don't know who you are, mm -hmm. it's virtually impossible to know right. how you are or where you're going. And right. your future. That's right. identity, purpose, and direction. And uh -huh. your future. What you say? Yeah. I mean, identity, purpose, and direction. Identity, purpose, and direction. And that mm -hmm. was Lamar Evans. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, 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 that's mm -hmm. Ranka. Mm -hmm. Ranka. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ranka. Yeah. I wanted to respond to you okay. um, that the, everything you said is correct. I mean, mm -hmm. in the sense that it gives a broad view mm -hmm. of what has happened. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I challenge with that uh, conversation at that level, because that at a, that's at a like a 10,000-foot um, uh, mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. and one of the challenges I have with that is that it has to be translatable. Mm -hmm. It has to be translatable at the community level. Right. And so part of it is community education. It's not the education inside of institutions. You start, to, you have to start to deconstruct it in little pieces. Right. And then you give it to the people, and then they show how that is representative of what is happening for them right now. 
they have to identify with it. But you give it in little pieces. And, and Paulo Freire was excellent at this, that he took what the people were experiencing and had them to analyze it. And so you bring that and bring little pieces of information, and they start to analyze it within the within the the context of their reality, and then they began to produce that knowledge mm -hmm. that you already have outlined mm -hmm. well, in that at that ten thousand foot level. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know that's another way to think about how do we educate our community. It's not just about the identity, but it's about how do we deconstruct what is happening for us right now and relate it. Decolon to that. <coughs> the decolonization manual. Right. Yes, yes. So okay. it's like, tr how do Are we you going to write that? How do we translate? And, you know, the, um, um, Peter Kessenbaum said that to me. He says, you got to take philosophy and you got to translate it. You mm -hmm. got to become a translator mm -hmm. right. for the people. For exactly. The people. Yeah, that's right. And articulate it. And um, so um, Walter Rodney wrote the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Mm -hmm. Then Marvel's Manning followed up how capitalism uh, underdeveloped black Americans. Mm -hmm. The name of my book is How Capitalism Killed the Black Race. Mm -hmm. And the statistics, the, mor the mortality rates, okay, uh, ADHD, you know, um, uh, global warming, genetic engineering, uh, relocation of, uh, of, of people into toxic areas, okay, uh, inundation, as you said, they get the worst food, the worst food product, okay, in their communities, all right, you know, the lowest education, okay, I mean, the greatest exposure level to toxins and chemtrails, asthma rates are so high in the Bronx because of all that automobile, vehicular traffic right. and transportation, right. okay, poorest food in the free lunch programs where they're just experiments, right. okay. But you know, they can't see it. They can't see it. It goes back to what this young, that man asked you yesterday. Why are you here? Why are you here? <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you think you can do mm -hmm. that hasn't been done? Right. right. Because we see this every day. We're living in this. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no, um, there's nothing to, uh, nothing to, to motivate me mm -hmm. to transcend that. So it's like, how do you transcend that? Because if you're living in it, it becomes your reality. That's right. You know, and Absolutely. that's your reality. And so your mindset is there. But if you have an identity, there's going to be at the highest level, at Abraham Maslow, you're going to actualize. So what are you connecting to actualize? That's I mean, right. what are you living for? Just to be a consumer? It's right, but people are because it's been programmed. And they that's the limit of their identity? Yeah. Right then now... I Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had a very interesting conversation with a childhood friend. This was some years ago. Her boss, the president of this major company, I don't want to mention the company, mm -hmm. wanted, he grew up in Brownsville and he wanted to get some pictures of, of uh, Brownsville because he, when he was there it was so beautiful and he loved it. And here we are in, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s and she's afraid to get pictures because she, she doesn't want to show him what his old building looks like now. So, and, and I guess it might have been about 97 at this point, and she had been putting it off and putting it off, and finally he said, listen, I'll come down, if you don't want to go over there, I'll come down and take, and take pictures. She says, no, 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 I'll take pictures. Anyway, she asked me, would you, would you take some pictures? And she told me what he wanted. I started laughing, I said, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, at the time I was reading a lot of uh, Dr. Seuss because my kids were small. <laughs> so we get over there and I'm taking That's pictures okay. of the, the pool with all of the molded green water in it. And I took pictures of the sign, mm -hmm. uh, took pictures of grass growing out of the, the ground. I took pictures of everything the people did not do. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show him that the neighborhood was unkept. And when I, when I showed her, I had an instant camera. I could just, just download it on, on a uh, disc. When she said, why did you take a picture of the, this? I said, well, this is what he needs to see. This is what the children see every day. If we show him the, the, the garbage can full of garbage, falling over, then he says, oh my God, they taught the neighborhood. But if he gets to look at what these kids look at every single day, he can say the municipality destroyed the city, mm -hmm. destroyed the area, not the children. And the reason these children are so angry 
is because look at their pool. Mm -hmm. The pool had grass growing out of it. And mm -hmm. I took pictures, color pictures mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, and they couldn't stop me. I was getting pictures of everything. I was standing next to um, grass growing through the ground up near my thigh and looking down and taking pictures. This is what wears and tears at your self-esteem and mm -hmm. your self-image. It becomes normalized. It, become, it becomes normal. It becomes what you expect. And if you grow up with it, and someone tries to change it, you're right out there with the rah rah, no team, no team. Don't don't take it down. Well, because goes back to what Fatima said. Carter, Carter J. Whitman said that if you have a low self-esteem, that if there's not a back of the bus, you will create one for You'll your create own one. benefit. <laughs> because comfortable back there. Because that's what you know. That's right. Right. You want to create one out of your own. And this is before Rosa Parks. Right. Mm -hmm. He's at the back of the bus. So right. for, for him even to have that scenario was like so deep. Yeah. Because he was he was on it. Yeah. And create so, one out of your own necessity. Yeah. And so when we can't uh, we can't see ten thousand feet up, it's because we don't have a mirror that's facing us that yeah. can help us see something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when people go in to help, they have to know that you're going in just as wounded, just as, you know, uh, uh, oppressed, so people can feel you. They can know mm -hmm. that you see them just like, a, you see them as another human being. You see them as yourself. That's right. You know, and that's how people start to relate in a way that they can see possibility. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's just, you, why are you here? You know, yeah. what, what can you do for why me? Do you, why do you love us? Why do you love us? Right. Yeah. Like, ain't nobody ever loved us. That's right. You know, not That's the way that we feel like we needed to be loved. Ain't nobody ever loved us. That park has looked like that forever. And right. now you're coming in saying you're going to fix check, it. Check this out. At Chester, when we started the project, they cut down the grass where the drugs were being hit, where the guns were being hit. The whole community came out and cut that and was cleaning up lots. I mean, it was like... Yeah. It was transformation. Yeah, and, and, and the mayor was taking our city back. Yes, the mayor, when we first went in, he was on city council. He got what we, where we were going. He got it so clearly that he stood on stage with the federal government isn't people. It, isn't this really interesting that we're sitting here talking to <laughs> Yay. a council person like we running did, for mayor? Running for mayor. <laughs> yes, he was wow. a council person. This is funny. He was on city council, really and he funny. got it. And he stood on stage, the federal government, Obama sent people there to give technical assistance to the city of Chester around the needs that they had with regards, not money, but technical assistance to, you know, shoring up their technology in the police department, shoring up their technology in city hall, da 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 da. He stood on stage and he started to talk about how he grew up and how his daddy used to smack his mo mother and why he went on the street and started beating up other people. He got what we were saying. So when he became mayor... He learned what you live. Yes, when he became mayor... He started community He asked me to come in and design conversations for nine of the neighborhoods that were experiencing the most violence, the most trauma, and he understood that to have people voice talking with each other was important. And so when he did that, like I just said, they started creating committees. Um, out of those nine neighborhoods, seven of them began to create committees to do to, to make the it's, government it's, accountable. It's remembering what was there. Because yes. they had these mm -hmm. block captains before. Mm -hmm. Where the block captains would be responsible for the block and the block captains would talk to each other. All this was a part of the social network. Yes. All got broken down over here, so they started to remember yes. who, they, who were, they were, what they did, and right. what they could do to get you. Yes. I, I've been writing about the homeless, and one of the things I've said to my staff, you have to keep saying their name, because yeah, they may remember that. who they are, yes. and where they come from. You have to keep saying, you, you can't you can't be, be um, uh, Onaje 8764. 42. But we have to call you by your name. Mm -hmm. And so if we do it enough and 
we would say mister or miss to to remind them remind the people we were working with that they were worthy of respect and that they were worthy of um, uh, being heard mm -hmm. sometimes I didn't agree with them sometimes they didn't agree with me sometimes I had to st take a stand and say it's my way or the highway but they were, we we're giving them something that we, we're the opening, opening, opening the dialogue mm -hmm. forces them to recall yes. all of this stuff that they've suppressed. Because in order to get my money, you got to be a patient. Mm -hmm. You want to collect my welfare, you got to be, you got to be a patient. You got to stay on drugs so that I have a reason to, to take care of you. You know. But they started remembering um, that they could take a stand or I'm going to get out of this program, or I want to get a job. They can, they started remembering their core, their insides. Core. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Started to, uh, sort of like you, when you make dough, you knead it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, um, when, uh, Ken, I think it was Ken that told me about this guy who did uh, a commencement speech, was it you? Yes. He did a commencement speech, and I go and talk, talk about this, that he only used seven words for the commencement speech. Mm -hmm. And those seven words were, know where you stand and stand there. That, for me, was the most awesome speech that anybody could make. <laughs> oh. Sorry, you got to put your shoes You still running? Go with your shoes. Okay. Bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was, that was, was for me, it was like, yeah, know where you stand and so stand there. So before you put it on YouTube, we have to we have to do get it cut. We have to look at it, get it cut. Mm -hmm. um,